Welcome all you marketing surfers there and sales surfers. It's time for another episode of Sales Pipeline. And today, we have a guest host with us here. Welcome, Robert Peace. Did I say the name correctly here? You did indeed. All right. Well, welcome. Identify yourself and tell us how you got to be the uh, guest host today here. Yeah, so I uh, lead a practice area at Heinz Marketing called Pipeline Performance, which is going to be the topic for today. And um, I know Matt is the regular uh, uh, guest on this show, and he asked me to to step in today and share a little bit of my perspective and and what I do at Heinz. I've uh, been on the operating side for a number of years, VP of Marketing, several companies, CMO, uh, ran a software company for several years as a CEO. So I'm uh, infinitely familiar with revenue and all the things related to the funnel and uh, have been working with the Heinz team for the past couple of years. Well, they tell us that today you're going to talk about the 10-step pipeline performance checklist. That's quite a mouthful here. Is <laughs> it? Do I need to get my pencil and paper out? Should you give us a couple minutes here to uh, grab a sheet of paper here? Yeah, that might be worthwhile. I mean, I think that there are uh, a lot of elements of this that companies already do and salespeople do and marketing people do. I think in, in a lot of places that, that we go and when we help companies um, get this sort of full funnel view of, of what they do, right, and how marketing relates to sales and how sales relates to marketing. And this is literally something that I'd like to sit down and go through with, with clients or prospective clients just to get a feel of, of, of where we are and, and where focus needs to be. And we all like checklists, right? So we all like to, to, to mark That's off it. the different steps. That David Letterman's famous top ten <laughs> list that he did for years. Yeah, right. All right, well, let's jump in. Give us some of the uh, top ten. Let's see if we can get through three or four of them before the break here. Yeah, no kidding. So I sort of look at this and I map this into the the stages of the funnel, if you will, right? So very outer edge stuff is finding our customers and then beginning conversations and all the way down to making them become our customers. And believe it or not, the first step here is all about uh, understanding your target customer. And it's not just knowing that you want people that happen to want to pay for what it is you sell. It's <laughs> right. about kind of mapping out and articulating this notion of an ideal customer profile, right? So uh, what makes the best customer for the product or service you sell? What creates the longest-term relationships with that customer? Um, ultimately, you want to understand them and their business as well as they do um, because it certainly helps you understand uh, what your product or service and how that fits into their world. So just articulating that is important. And let me ask you, let me interrupt you for one yeah. second. Why, why is that such a perplexing question for most companies for years i did public relations i've also done radio for years and somebody wants to run an ad somebody wants to target uh, a pr piece at some audience and i say okay who's your target audience everybody yeah. everybody can buy this well maybe but everybody isn't an answer that you can build a strategy around Agreed, you know, and, and it's so much hinges off of understanding your target customer, even the PR example, right? Your, yeah. your goal is to, to get into the consumption patterns of this optimal profile of customer and who in that organization impacts a, a buying decision. If there's four or five people, right, then, then you've got some complexity because you've got to reach all of those people. But you have to sort of take a very structured approach to this. And also it's about being, in a, in a sense, stingy uh, with sales time and efficient with marketing spend because you don't want to market or sell to people that aren't going to be your customer. Yeah, or marginally customer. worthwhile pursuing. That's another thing. Not only who will buy it, but I'm surprised most companies haven't taken the time to analyze who's the best customer. Okay, yeah. so maybe everybody can buy, but who do you make the most money of? Who do you, who do you close the most deals with? Who, who has the most need for your services? I don't see companies really do that. They, they, they think somehow that's limiting. Do you guys work with them and help them define this target customer? Yeah, we, we do, for sure, right? And that, that sort of leads to the second piece on the checklist, which is, which, which is knowing what a qualified lead or qualified customer looks yeah, like. Yeah, boy, that, um, that, that's a whole big one. We could spend a whole topic on that. You know, because sales managers always say, give me more leads to the PR or marketing people. And then they send the leads through and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted qualified leads. Right, right. Not just well, yeah, quantity. And, that's, and that's, that's around definitions, right? We spend a lot of time at the intersection between sales and marketing and, you know, and, and drilling into those definitions. And, look, there's, there certainly is uh, um, something interesting about someone who comes to you and downloads a white paper. Right. Uh, that person is not ready to receive an order form. Um, <laughs> right. If you've done your job correctly, you've targeted the ideal customer profile and you have a set of criteria that says, okay, it's this kind of company and this kind of size and this role. And now that person has raised their hand and they're interested in some way. 
and then having a little bit of patience in how you do this, which is to say there may be two or three marketing touches or more uh, required before someone gets to the point where they actually are leaning forward enough to, to talk to someone uh, about doing business with you, right, before it goes to sales. And so, look, there's there's everything you can do from writing this down on a piece of paper and, and having both the marketing teams and sales teams all sign it, right? This yeah, it becomes right. sort of this almost service level agreement thing. Um, and I'm a huge fan of just in meetings, just have everybody saying the definition out loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> All, the All of this sounds so silly. I mean, I'm laughing, and yet I've sat in so many meetings and thought, I, these guys don't have a clue what a yeah. qualified lead is. They're just looking for massive lists of people to call, which, of course, means the salespeople end up throwing these away because they find that this is a worthless list. Well, sure, and it and it and it doesn't encourage anybody, right? If if all you're basically getting is maybe a valid phone number and maybe a valid email, and, and your expectation that's on you is to, to close that to business, I mean, it just sets everybody up for failure. Yeah, right. Um, so I think those are important things, you know. And then and then as it we go, as we're moving through our checklist here. The the third point, which dovetails nice nicely off of this, is the message that you use, right? And this isn't just this sort of higher level, softer, you know, what are the words that we use? But it's about speaking to your ideal customer profile to attract the qualified leads you're looking for and understanding the problem they have and, and, and the, the outcome they're seeking. Um, so many companies want to spend time talking about their features and their benefits and how they do what they do. And I get it. And there's a time and a place for that. But it's almost like, you know, spend the first couple of customer interactions or prospect interactions and don't talk about you at all. You know, understand the day in the life, understand the pressure, understand the need. And, and if, if what you sell is not something that's a top priority for a company, then you're going to have to elevate that need. Um, if it is a top priority, then your command of that problem or that issue is really going to come forward in the sales process and will make you stand apart. And again, this is back to this uh, this kind of notion of being, being patient with the overall sales process. I mean, again, we want to have our metrics and our numbers and our quarterly goals and, and all those things. Um, but you can't you can't close in the first contact. Yeah, and and why do we think we can? You must have been listening to our shows this morning here because we did two different shows this morning, and they each touched on this same topic. One of them is a show called Contact Marketing, and and it's mm-hmm. all about how do you break through to people of. Uh, that you really need to meet how do you get through the gatekeepers creative strategies fun stuff interesting stuff crazy stuff but how do you get through to people and the point that this guy guest was making this morning is okay now you got through to them don't just burst out and start rattling out your features and benefits as quickly as you can as if that's all he wants to hear you got through to the guy you got his attention he or she you got their attention now what do you do? You listen. You ask some questions. You find out what you talk about them. Don't talk about you immediately. Yeah, or you know, and it's 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 hard to do this, but uh, when you're in the the sort of in the mix, but like you know, have an interaction and leave something with the prospect that that they'll get value out of, whether or not they talk to you ever again. Right, and this is, you see this a lot where you know someone it's at an event and there's a bunch of people in the audience and somebody wants to get on stage because they got their 20 minutes and they want to do a demo. Yeah, right. The only person in that auditorium that wants to see the demo uh, is the person speaking. Right, <laughs> and, and their sales manager. And, the sales manager. <laughs> and then they feel like they gave a demo, and and then that's going to get actually to the next point on our uh, checklist here, which is around conversion rates. But well, but to reinforce that point, which is, you know, look if you if you if you have command of the subject matter and you're a peer almost in the discussion, um, you know, the, the sort of natural conclusion that you're the best to solve it will unfold, right? Yeah. I mean, you have to be methodical about this, and that's that's number four on our checklist, right? But before you go, though, uh, one yeah. other thing that drives me crazy, maybe I'm the only one that feels this way, but I suspect not. When you talk about asking questions and getting to know people, it doesn't have to be this fake discourse that so many people start with. Hey, how are you doing today? Hey, how's your day going? Uh, you, you know, as if that's all you need to do before you launch into your sales pitch here. It really is diving deeper into that, isn't it? Oh, oh I think so. I mean, I think, you know, human relationships are certainly important, but, you know, the, the, the utilization of someone's time has to be efficient, right? If someone's going to give you time on their day and time on their calendar, you know, the, the sort of, you know, icebreaker making small talk, I'd rather spend that time sharing what I've seen out there. I think one of the most powerful phrases is, you know, what we see is, 
right? Because if you're in the market and you sell a product right. or a service to companies like the one that you're visiting, you know, you, you, you establish more credibility when you're like, look, you know, yep, everyone's, everyone's struggling with this same issue because of this change in technology or this new regulation or this change in consumer purchasing. And, you know, here's how we see companies tackling it. And where we've helped people is the following. Right. Um, I think those are, I think those are important things, right? I mean, I, I think that especially given there's so much available online now to help arm you with context before you walk in. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, do you really advise people or work with them or, or train them, teach them how to do their homework before they walk in the door? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and what's what's so disappointing about it is the bar is so low. I mean, <laughs> you know, there there is uh, one of my uh, pet peeves of sort of sales outreach, right, or, or prospecting emails that go out or emails that say, you know, can you point me to the right person? Yeah, right. I I'm, I, I, I'm too lazy to figure it out. So here, uh, I got your name somehow. You do my work for me here. Yeah, I think it's kind of malpractice, right? It's like, look, there's there's so many resources available. Again, if you know who your ideal customer is and you right. know who you're supposed to talk to within that customer, you know, getting the last mile of information to know that that's Robert P is, is not very complex. The, the balance here is, you know, you, you want to sort of do as much as you can as fast as you can. And so you, you sort of depersonalize and you remove context because you send the same message to 10,000 people hoping – that some percentage will convert. Yeah, right. Um, you know, conversion rates, which is you know number four on the checklist here, and understanding what those are is, is an absolute quantitative measure you need to know. And and and, but don't don't fool yourself based on the size of the numbers. If you feel good because you sent ten thousand emails and you had two clicks, hmm. you know, could you have been that much better if you'd have been much more targeted and much more value added? And again, knowing the different stages, right, of your funnel and understanding that math is appropriate here. And if your sales plan says you have to have a thousand customers customers by the end of the year and your sales cycle is 12 months long you know where all those deals have to be in the pipe now yeah right, right. so so explain the difference just so i understand it between conversion ratio and closing ratio closing would be the end of the cycle and yep. those could be dramatically different numbers if you get in front of the right person you're probably going to get a higher closing ratio and again if you've got a good product and you explain it well and you take the time to get to know them all these things you're saying but conversion you're saying how much of this initial outreach do people really receive and respond to yeah, I mean, I, I like to look at it, and again, you know, we're funnel people at Heinz in, in, in different levels of it, which is, you know, look, if I've identified a set of target um, uh, accounts and I know the people within those accounts and I'm trying to get some level of conversation started, whether I choose to do that via email or I do that via webinar or whatever it is, there's a conversion that's happening, right, between that, that sort of prospect universe and active conversations. Um, and then there's a conversion that happens between an active conversation and some type of sales engagement right right and then there's some type of conversion between sales engagement and forecasted to close right, right? and then there's this another stage of, of, of forecasted to close to close rate and in the math and all those is is, is is important because you you have to be vigilant and constantly look at how can I how can I improve that um, that's what I was going to say because on conversion that's why I'm kind of taking a moment to stop in this mm-hmm. I see so many people say All right, so we sent out 10,000 emails, to use your example, and we got two people to click on this stuff here. Great. We just accept that's our conversion rate. So now we need to send out 100,000 emails to get four or whatever whatever the math is. And I'm like, wait a minute. Maybe you got crappy stuff you're sending out here. Maybe you should reevaluate why do you accept that that's just the way it is. Yeah, for sure, and you see that as well in like conversion rates on on landing pages, right? Yeah. A very uh, topical thing in, in online marketing, and you know everybody that visits a page is not going to convert. Uh, yeah. Your right. if your conversion is low because you're doing stuff and you're there's a there's a goal to drive traffic versus uh, contextual traffic to that to that page to download the asset or request information um, and there's all sorts of things that go on so a hundred uh, uh, visits to a page with one conversion uh, versus five visits to a page and three. Right. Yeah, right and and knowing um, um, how that sort of efficiency all kind of comes together so I just I think that you know the, the step back point is that it's important to look at 
the, 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 the entire sort of funnel, right, from sort of getting people engaged to getting them into um, a sales process and how each of those different uh, percentages of, of progress, right, uh, play out. And then looking at, at that over time and knowing with some certainty, like, wow, if I can get somebody to give us a chance, right, if I can get somebody to give me, you know, 20 minutes to do a demo, I know that I can close 70% of those, then that sort of becomes what, what the focal point is, and you can then forecast off of that. Exactly. Well, that's why we're trying to break it down into a simple checklist they can go through and analyze what part of it they're missing what data are they not understanding here we got to take a quick break we've only gone through four of them so we'll rush the rest when we come (laughs) back right after this and the question is well in a world where the speed of innovation and change to b2b marketing has never been greater the only thing bigger is The need for clarity. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Understand. Get a blueprint, a guide, what's really working, and how to apply it specifically to your sales pipeline to increase the growth of the pipeline, the velocity at which stuff moves through it, and ultimately the conversion rate. And that's what you'll find in the Modern Marketer's Field Guide. Download it for free today, right now. Heinz Marketing, just like it sounds, H-E-I-N-Z, marketing.com. It is really covers the entire sales and marketing pipeline in much greater depth than we're just doing here in this brief outline. But in quick bursts with lots of specific actionable ideas, strategies, and tactics you can put to work right now, like today. The loaded table of contents helps you narrow in on what you want to find fast and tackle a problem that you're facing today. You can also come back to it over and over again when you want to brush up or get some ideas. It really is an invaluable field guide that should be stuffed in the back of every salesman's pocket. Download your free copy today at HeinzMarketing.com. That's H-E-I-N-Z, Marketing.com. All right, well, we can't give you the whole field guide in 20 minutes here, but we're trying to come up with at least a checklist here. What have we gone through? Four here? Guys, summarize the four and let's launch into five here. Yeah, so we've covered number one, which is understanding your target customer, knowing what a qualified lead looks like is number two, emphasizing needs and outcomes in your sales and marketing messaging, uh, and then number four, understanding your conversion rates. Right. And I can hear everybody groaning and saying, I know all of that stuff right now. It seems like some of those are the – they want to jump to the end of how do I close stuff here, and and they're creating – they're confused who they should go after. They're – unclear of how many of them they need to approach to get a conversation started and they haven't really analyzed their thought through a lot of these metrics here and then they're wondering why their closing ratio is so low on these things here all right number five i'm going to take five and six together uh, to give us some optimization number five is around follow-up Right, and it's it's always follow up, which I think is a rule in life. You mean you've got uh, to can... follow up? I thought this is automated. I send it out, and the orders come in. Come on, follow up, and then number six is engage in context. And we talked a little bit about context already, but like simple follow up is 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 you know if you tell someone you're going to do something, then do it. Yeah. If someone requests some information, then provide it to them. If you have a conversation, then follow up with the action items. I think it's just good good vigilance. And, you know, there's there's automated ways to do this, right? If someone comes to your site and requests information and that kicks off an email internally and it routes to a, a person, but they're out of the office today or they don't get to it. I mean, there's ways to just follow up in a more automated way that you need to understand. And also, just because somebody's not ready to buy today or next week or the next month, doesn't mean you can't continue or you don't need to continue to communicate with that person. So I've we seen a lot of time just sort of like add a stage to sales uh, pipeline, which is nurture. Yes. And I see so many people throw stuff away. Jim Obermeyer, who uh, runs the Funnel Radio Channel, does his own uh, show, SLMA, talks about it all the time. The shockingly low follow-up on leads. Leads are generated. Maybe they're good, qualified leads. Half of them never get called. If they do and they and they don't get through to the person or they don't buy right away, half of those, again, get thrown away in a, in a wastebasket. And, and yet somebody, the statistics show that those leads that somebody raised their hand, Probably 75, 80% of them are going to buy something in the next few months here. That's why they raised their hand. Yeah, for sure. Right? Why do we give up so of... quick here? Why do we throw this away and, and say, ah, that's no good? Well, I, I think that, you know, good, good salespeople view the world through their, their compensation plans. And so, <laughs> um, you know, if I get a lead and, and it doesn't look like it's going to close within a time period, then 
I'm going to sort of push that off. And I think, you know, most, or not most, a lot of organizations just don't have a good cadence between that scenario and letting marketing know that that needs, that needs additional help, yeah. right? That that one's going to need two or three touches. It's going to need a case study. It's going to need a best practices guide. It's going to need whatever uh, to get them back into the fold. Because, you know, again, there's tons of scary stats out there about leads just falling through the cracks. And yeah. that's expensive and it's a waste of money. Yeah. And, it, and it's, doesn't it some of it go to the sales management as well? as Because they're driving you to get results today, tomorrow. That leads you to say, well, this one isn't going to close tomorrow, so I better throw it away or put it away. Yeah. i, well, I got to focus on tomorrow. Know, works together right that's you know is it qualified do we have agreed upon qualification criteria um and then as we you know moving through our checklist here and 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 the number seven point is actually this right which is to understand how your customer buys Mm. sales and marketing processes so often are sort of the the vendor dictating that process on the customer and it's and it's it's out of alignment right and I'm i'm a huge fan of you know you should staff about how around how your customer buys, and you, and you should certainly sell and market around how they buy. So Staff give me an example mean, of that, because that one I don't understand clearly. How would I know what their internal process is? How long it takes? Who, how many steps there are? And yeah. and I mean, if it's a if it's a hands on, let's say you know piece of software that requires you know pilots and 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 committee based purchasing or whatever, which certainly is a, a a category of it out there, right? You don't want to be emphasizing uh, to to too much inf- to too much degree your your marketing staffing around paper click advertising Hmm. right you don't need to have a what you need is you need a solutions marketing person you need someone that can help understand and enable that entire process Mm -hmm. if it's if it's 12 to 15 meetings before a decision is made that's that is how you build supporting sales and marketing process if it's a high volume high transaction visit the website sign up for a trial the product takes you through the entire thing then you optimize around that um, from a staffing standpoint, mm-hmm. um, I just, again, I just in this, you know, it kind of gets to um, the next point here, number eight, which is around, about getting on the same side of the table, um, and this is sort of consistent thematically with what we've been talking about, which is you know, you and your prospect view the problem or challenge together. It's much less confrontational, right? Imagine sort of literally sitting down in a room and looking at a screen together as opposed to sitting across the table from each other. Yeah, that's what they used to call consultative sailing or whatever, where you really down, is you're coming in to help them solve a problem here, and you're doing it together rather than trying to jam this down their throat and close a deal so you can move on and look good here. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and you become sort of part of the answer, right? I think that's, that's such an important thing, and, and you become um, uh, very credible in the overall process, and it's not a, oh, God, we've got to deal with those people again. They're yeah. coming in. That guy's going to want to – he's going to ask me for the order. Right. Doesn't he understand – that I have to go and this has to be looked at by so-and-so and and this approval. And, I mean, again, it's always this sort of tension that exists between the timeline you want to close something on, right, and how somebody actually is going to go through that purchasing process. You don't want to lose momentum. You certainly – I mean, the goal is, in in a perfect world, as you put all this together, is you tell your customer or your prospect the next step, Mm. (laughs) right? So now we've done this. You guide them to say, well, I guess we're ready to talk about this here then. yeah, Correct. Correct. And I think that, again, it's all very consultative. But, again, I think the, the visual or the metaphor around getting on the same side of the table, you know, so you're not just staring at somebody trying to get them to give you their money for your product or service um, is, a, is a much more sort of up-leveled and, uh, and mature way to do things. Somebody once told me that the, in that line of thinking, it's sort of like going to a wine tasting dinner or something. Whoever is running the event start tells you, okay, it's time for the next course here, and it's time for the next wine, and here's what we're going to do. Put your forks down, and let's get going here. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, again, if, if you're dialed in around the problem you solve and the customer and you know all these things to be true, um, you just you just sort of begin continue to sort of beat the drum that you're a trusted provider in the whole thing. All right. We're uh, down to, what, nine or ten here? We're, we're on number nine. Uh, which, you know, is kind of why we're doing all this. Number nine is to get a purchase commitment. And this is, you know, early on in the process, you want to make sure you've got qualified opportunities, that your sales team is investing the time where it needs to to be. But it's also understanding the core it's sort of end goal here, right, which is, you know, to, to, to have a purchase happen. And I think there's no shortage of books and methodologies out there around, you know, telling, you know, if I can solve these problems and I show you I solve these problems, you know, do I, do I, uh, you know, will you do business with me or whatever the structure may be. Why are just, so many salespeople today afraid to ask for the order? It seems like they're so in love with the process and they're so proud of the fact that they've got all these leads in the pipeline. I've got all these things going. It looks good on a report, but nothing ever closes. Nothing ever happens here. So you can go almost the other way from the old school where 
where you're trying to close them in the first time to you're never going to close them. It's just a never-ending process here. Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, I, I'm a fan of the, the notion of kind of desired end states at every meeting. And if I know it's going to take five or ten discussions, I know at the end of discussion one, what am I trying to get? Am I trying to get agreement to the mm-hmm. problem, right, uh, and commitment to uh, expanding the conversation, right? Okay, great. D- uh, second conversation, what's my desired end state, right? Do I want to understand that this person has the authority to make this decision? Forget about what it's ultimately going to look like, you know, and I think that mapping those things out, and again, this is back to understanding how your customer buys and your responsibility from a sales standpoint, right, is to certainly understand how each of those stages unfolds, but what your sort of selfish need is in it. Because, again, you don't want to waste your time if yeah. you spend... Or theirs, right, their time. Theirs. So you don't want to just be caught in an endless process here that just seems to never go anywhere. All right, number 10, wrap it up. Yeah, number 10 is uh, it's sort of the... Uh, it's a good sort of departure uh, point here on, on them, is that closed one, which is our goal, um, is just the end of the beginning. And I think that, that the full life cycle sort of sales and marketing mindset understands you work so hard to get a conversation, you work so hard to get a customer that you've got to make sure that customer is happy, right? Because that customer can become a source of referrals, right? Which matter more than any marketing program you'll ever run. Boy, that's the truth. Uh, and more business. Test- more business, yeah. Yeah, testimonials, right? Trusted, sort of someone else has stepped up and said, yes, this company did indeed solve this problem for me. And then, and again, back to profitability, which is if you work so hard to get all these customers in and your sales team works so hard to get them closed and they churn out within 30 days, 60 yeah. days, 90 days, 120 days, you know, you're, you're just not taking the full view. And so, you know, don't, don't be afraid of calculating, you know, lifetime value. Yeah, and I don't think a lot in today's immediate results world we live in, this is my common complaint with banks and, I don't know, insurance companies or automobile manufacturers. All they're focused on is that one deal and then they go on. There is very little customer service follow-up. They don't nurture a long-term relationship, and that's why people flip brands every few years here. They just don't seem to. And I think the same is true in B2B. I just don't think they're looking at it as a long-term relationship. Got to go get another one. Yeah, I mean, you know, right, that back to sort of balancing right, to near-term sort of objectives with, with, with longer-term sort of growth and, and, and stability in a business. And, you know, the, the again, the, the, the power of, of, a, of a long-term, very uh, embedded customer it, you know, can't be underestimated. And so, you know, and sometimes you get organizations where what's being marketed is not what's being sold. What's being sold is not what's being delivered, right? And then yeah. there's much frustration and weeping and gnashing of teeth all the way around. Yeah. So, so good alignment, I think, is important, right? If you're like, look, we don't support you know, companies that run this type of infrastructure. Well, we got to wrap things up. I'd love to go further. I've probably gone too far already here. How do they find you? How do they learn more about this modern marketer's field guide or the work you do or even this checklist to, to dive into it and take a look at it? Yeah, just come uh, visit us at HeinzMarketing.com, just like it sounds, like you said. Plenty of information there. The blog is, is rich with content, and you can contact contact us there and we'd happy to have a conversation all right thanks so much robert peace from heinz marketing this 10 what sounds like incredibly simple checklist that each one of them we could spend an hour on and figure out why people don't do it in better detail here thanks so much yeah i enjoyed it thanks all right well you've been riding the surf the sales surf pipeline folks from heinz marketing 